So welcome back. So in unit four, we're talking about the behavior of free carriers, electrons, and holes under non-equilibrium conditions. And the first three lectures are about carrier transport, how carriers flow under the influence of an applied bias. And this lecture is the last of those three lectures. The topic is the drift diffusion equation. So let's dive into it. This is our treatment of carrier transport. We have this fundamental Landauer expression that describes large devices, small devices, or devices in between. And we have this special case that describes bulk semiconductors. Most of semiconductor physics and the understanding of semiconductor devices is based on an equation of this kind. But it's usually presented in a different way, and we want to understand that way uh, in this lecture. So the current equation is n mu times gradient of the quasi-Fermi level. But we can re-express this equation with just a little bit of algebra. We know that the electron density is related exponentially to the quasi-Fermi level. I can solve this expression for the quasi-Fermi level. And then I can take its gradient. Okay? And then I can insert that gradient into the current expression. And now I'll have two terms in the current expression. One involving the gradient of the bottom of the conduction band, and one involving the gradient of the electron density. Now I recall that when I apply a positive voltage, I lower the energy levels. So the conduction band is moving with position because the electrostatic potential is changing with position. So when I differentiate the conduction band, take its slope, the reference won't give me anything, that's a constant. I'll be differentiating the electrostatic potential. Well, you may recall that minus the gradient of the electrostatic potential is the electric field. So the slope of the conduction band minima is Q times the electric field. And I can use that in my expression here instead of the bottom of the conduction band. I'll also make a definition. You know, I'll define the parameters here, k t, t times mu. That's multiplying a concentration gradient, so that should be the diffusion coefficient. Okay, and I see I, I get a relation then between the diffusion coefficient and the mobility d over mu is equal to kt over q. That's a relation that we've seen before. Putting it all together, I get a current equation that is known as the drift diffusion equation. So what you should remember, it's mathematically the same as this expression in terms of the gradient of the quasi-Fermi level. We have simply pulled it apart into two separate components, one involving the electric field and one involving the concentration gradient. This is a very important equation because it's widely used in semiconductor devices. Okay, let's take a look at this drift diffusion equation then. The relation between the diffusion coefficient and mobility is one that we've developed. Uh, we've seen a couple of times now in these lectures. It was first uh, introduced or first discovered by Albert Einstein in 1905. Now let's look at these two components, the drift component and the diffusion component. The first component is due to the currents, due to electrons drifting in an electric field. An electric field will exert a force minus Q times electric field in the opposite direction on electrons. That will move electrons, they will acquire a velocity, and the speed with which they move is proportional to the mobility. So we call that component of the current a drift component. The other part of the current is a diffusion current. Where this is due to the diffusion of electrons in a concentration gradient. This has nothing to do with their charge. There is no force due to anything. It's random thermal motion causing the electrons, as any particles would, to diffuse down a concentration gradient. And it's described by this diffusion coefficient, which has units of meters squared per second, and which is related intimately to the mobility. So these two components are, have a close relation. Well, what I'd like to do in the next few slides is just talk a little more about these two different components so we can get a little more of a feel for what they're all about. So think about the drift component. 
Here I have a semiconducting slab with some cross-sectional area A, and I have some electrons in that slab. Let's say that I have applied no voltage. This slab is just sitting there in equilibrium. But the thermal energy is rattling the atoms around. The atoms are interacting with the electrons and knocking them around. So these electrons are in random thermal chaotic motion. Their overall average velocity is zero, but they have some kinetic energy. The average kinetic energy is 3 halves kT. Okay. Well, kT is 1 half mv squared if these are parabolic bands. Well, we have to use the effective mass here. So we, we might be able to figure out how fast are these electrons moving in random chaotic directions. Well, I could simply solve this equation for the square root of the velocity squared. That would be the root mean squared velocity. And I get an expression for the thermal velocity, 3 kT over effective mass. Now, you put numbers in for semiconductors like silicon or any common semiconductor, you find it's on the order of 10 to the 7th centimeters per second. Okay, so that's pretty fast that electrons are bouncing around in random thermal motion. It's not 10 to the 10th, that's not the speed of light, but this is a pretty fast velocity. Now, one thing I should point out is that this root mean square thermal velocity, this is different from the unidirectional thermal velocity that, that we discussed earlier. The unidirectional thermal velocity is the average velocity along one of the coordinate axes. The root mean square thermal velocity is a measure of their average kinetic energy in any direction. So this is an example of where when people mention that they're using a thermal velocity in a calculation, it's important that you understand which thermal velocity are you talking about. Okay, but we've dedu deduced that these electrons are really jostling around very rapidly before we even apply a voltage to the semiconductor. Well, then if we apply a voltage, a positive voltage on the right side, it's going to attract the electrons, but they're going to frequently scatter. They're going to undergo some type of random walk, but they'll have a small preference to move from the left to the right because there's a positive voltage on the contact on the right that is pulling them towards it. So that's going to cause there to be a small average motion superimposed on top of this large randomly directed velocity. It's only the average motion that matters because the random thermal motion averages out and gives us zero current. So it's this average drift velocity, which tends to be very small compared to the thermal velocity, that matters. The average drift velocity is proportional to the electric field. The constant of proportionality is this mobility that we've been talking about. The higher the mobility, the faster the electrons will move for a given electric field. Now, if we ask ourselves, how can we compute I? That's what we're after, knowing that we have electrons here moving at an average velocity of minus mu times the electric field. What current is flowing? Well, we can think about it this, this way. We remember that early on, we're taught that current is charge divided by time. So it's the total amount of charge that flows in the time it takes for that charge to flow out of the device. Q would be the charge in the device, and T sub T, the transit time, would be the time it takes for that charge to leave the device. So charge divided by time. Well, what is the charge? Well, it's negative because the charge on an electron is negative. Q is the magnitude of the charge. N is the electron density, and A times L is the volume of the semiconductor. N is the concentration per cubic meter. A times L is the number of cubic meters. That's the total charge Q. What is the time? How much time does it take to move all of that charge out of this little resistor? Well, it's just the length of the resistor divided by that average drift velocity. Okay, so the current then, I would simply take uh, I would simply take the total charge, divide it by this time, and I would find that the current is n q average velocity times cross-sectional area. Okay, it all makes sense. The more electrons, the more current. The more charge, q, the more current. Of course, q has a fixed number, 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19th coulombs. The faster they move, the more charge I'm going to get out in a given time, so the more current. The larger the cross-sectional area, the more 
paths I have for current to flow, the larger the current. If I'm interested in the current density, I would divide by the cross-sectional area, and the current density would just be minus nq times velocity. If I were to do this for positively charged holes, it would simply be plus hole concentration times q times average velocity of holes. Okay, so these relations relate the current flow to the average drift velocity. Well, we know the average drift velocity. It's minus mobility times electric field for electrons plus hole mobility times electric field for holes. The mobility, well, we've seen how it's related to material parameters such as the thermal velocity and the mean free path. The shorter the mean free path, the more scattering there is, the harder it is for the carriers to move, the slower their average motion will be. Now, you'll often see another expression for mobility that's completely equivalent, Q tau over effective mass. Uh, tau is the average time between scattering events. The shorter that time is, the more the scattering, the lower the mobility. So our Landauer expression expresses the mobility in terms of mean free path. This expression expresses the mobility in terms of scattering time. They're mathematically equivalent if you're careful about details. So people will measure in, in the lab the average velocity versus electric field of electrons and holes in a bulk semiconductor. The characteristic will look something like this. If the electric field is not too large, the velocity will be proportional to the magnitude of the electric field, just as we've postulated here. But if the, th this is the region we call low field, or near equilibrium, or linear transport. This is what we expect when we apply small voltages. But if you apply large voltages, we can see that the current doesn't increase indefinitely, the velocity doesn't increase indefinitely, it tends to saturate at a value. Okay. So if we look at actual characteristics, silicon, we'll see that if the electric field is below about 10 kilovolts per centimeter, the velocity is proportional to the electric field. But if the electric field is significantly higher than 10 kil kilovolts per centimeter, the velocity saturates at about 10 to the 7th centimeters per second, which just happens to be the average thermal velocity. If we look at different semiconductors, we can see that under low fields, the velocity is proportional to the electric field in gallium arsenide, but the velocity is much higher, indicating that gallium arsenide has a much higher mobility. At higher energies, there's some complicated things that take place. Electrons move to different valleys in the conduction band, the scattering increases, the velocity drops down, and ends up in almost any semiconductor, you will find that under high electric fields, the velocity is reduced to on the order of 10 to the 7th centimeters per second. That's sort of the speed limit for electrons and holes in bulk semiconductors. This regime is called high field transport or sometimes hot carrier transport because the carriers have a lot of energy and we think of their energy as being related to their temperature by the 3 halves kT relation. The region that we are focusing on in our drift diffusion equation is this near equilibrium or linear transport regime. But in semiconductor devices, we're going to have to deal with this regime as well. Okay, so we have our expressions for drift current. Uh, drift current is nq mu times mobility, nq times mobility proportional to the electric field as long as the electric field is not too large. To describe high field transport, we just extend these equations. We make the mobilities a function of the electric field such that they get smaller and smaller as the electric field gets higher and higher and the curve rolls over and saturates at the proper value. So in semiconductor work, you will frequently hear people talk about field-dependent mobilities. This is a way to make the velocity versus field characteristic behave the way that it does uh, experimentally and the way more rigorous theories uh, will, will, will describe it. Let me just say a couple of words about the mobility. As long as we're in the low field regi regime, the mobility is simply a field, a material dependent quantity tightly related to the scattering. If I were to measure the mobility as a function of doping in a semiconductor, I might see the mobility 
for, for electrons in silicon as a function of the doping of the n-type silicon do something like this. The numbers here are typical values for silicon. If it's lightly doped or pure silicon, the mobility is over 1300 centimeters squared per volt second. If it's heavily doped, the mobility is significantly lower. I could measure the mobility for holes in p-type semicon, in p-type silicon as a function of doping. Hole mobilities tend to be smaller than electron mobilities, but as I go to higher and higher doping densities, the mobility gets lower and lower. Uh, why is it getting lower and lower? Well, the reason has to do with increased scattering. So for example, in an n-type semiconductor, the donors provide electrons to the conduction band. That's what they're supposed to do. But they leave behind an ionized charge, which can interact with the electrons. So if an electron is zipping past the dopant, it can see that positive charge and be deflected. That's a scattering event, because that will reduce the velocity of, of the electrons in one particular direction and lower the mobility. So the mean free path is lower. The average time between scattering events is lower when I have more and more of these dopants in the semiconductor. That causes the mobility to drop as I increase the doping density. Now, semiconductor people will also frequently plot the mobility versus temperature at a fixed doping density. And the mobility versus temperature might have a characteristic that looks like this. At low temperatures, it increases as t to the 3 halves in semiconductors like silicon and germanium. At high temperatures, it decreases with temperature as t to the th minus 3 halves power. Now, what's going on here? Again, it has everything to do about scattering and thermal velocities. At high temperatures, um, there are there's much more random thermal motion of the lattice jiggling around. The lattice interacts with electrons and, and knocks electrons around more rigorously. The time between scattering events drops, the main free path drops, and the mobility drops the higher the temperature is due to that process. Now, under low temperatures, there isn't much jiggling around of the lattice. The scattering is likely to be dominated by the interactions with the dopants in the semiconductor lattice. But there, the, as I increase the temperature, I increase the average thermal velocity. So electrons zip past these charged ionized impurities faster. They interact less. They're scattered less. So the mobility gets higher as you increase the temperature. Eventually, it turns around and drops as the lattice scattering gets more and more important and starts to take over and lower the mobility. So you'll see these characteristic type of curves and uh, that are uh, frequently measured. I guess the key point is that if we're working with semiconductor devices, we will undoubtedly need to know the mobility in order to, do, to understand what the mobility is or to look it up in a table. We need to know what the doping is and we need to know what the temperature is. So we can summarize some key points here. We have a drift current that's related to carrier concentrations and mobility. We can lump all of these parameters together into a conductivity. The conductivity is n q mu. To test yourself, you can do a dimensional analysis here and confirm that the units of conductivity are Siemens per meter. Um, same kind of thing go on for holes. We have a hole conductivity that is hole concentration times Q times hole mobility. Now in a semiconductor device, I might have both electrons and holes. If I want the total current, I then have to add the current due to electrons and the current due to holes. So the total conductivity will be the sum of the conductivity due to electrons and the conductivity due to holes. Okay, my total current then will be determined by my total conductivity. Very frequently, we'll prefer to quote resistivities. Resistivity is just one over conductivity. Resistivity has the units ohm meters or ohm centimeters. Okay, so if we were to examine a simple device, a resistor, let's ask ourselves, what would the resistance of this resistor be? A resistor, a semiconductor with a length A and a cross-sectional area a length L and a cross-sectional area A. Well, the current is conductivity times electric field. 
uh, the current density, I need to multiply by the area, the cross-sectional area, to get the actual current, not current density. So it's sigma conductivity times cross-sectional area times electric field. And the unit for currents is amps. Well, if I look at the current, um, I can remember that the definition of electric field, the units are volts per centimeter. It's the voltage applied across the resistor divided by the length of the resistor. That's the electric field. So if I regroup some things, if I take this A and bring this L together with it and put the voltage out to the right, I can lump parameters together. I find current is proportional to voltage. The constant of proportionality is the conductance, or 1 over the resistance. So the resistance is 1 over the conductivity, or resistivity, length divided by cross-sectional area. So the resistivity is a material parameter that tells us how resistive the semiconductor is. The longer the resistor is, the more resistance, but the wider the cross-sectional area, the less the resistance is. Okay, so we've talked quite a bit about the, about the drift current. Let me just talk very briefly about the diffusion current, because you've probably encountered diffusion before. So let's say I take a semiconductor in equilibrium and I dope it non-uniformly. It's doped heavily near x equals zero and more and more lightly as I go into the semiconductor. Well, there will be a particle flux. Electrons will flow down the concentration gradient. And the flux, the flux of particles will be the current divided by the charge on a hole. Uh, it's just the number per square centimeter per second. And the flux of, of holes diffusing down that concentration gradient will have units of number per square centimeter per second. That flux will be minus the concentration gradient times the diffusion coefficient. So in this case, if I'm thinking of these as holes, this would be the whole diffusion coefficient. So particles diffuse. This has been known for a long time. This is, uh, I want to point out that this is due to random thermal motion. You know, electrons are undergoing random scattering events. They might scatter in the forward direction. They might scatter in the backward direction. Just the fact that there are more on one side than there are on the other side will lead to a net flow of particles from high concentration to low concentration. There is no actual force that's pushing the holes, in this case, from high concentration to low concentration. It's simply a statistical effect. So we, if we have holes, we will have a flux of holes. If we multiply by Q, we'll have a whole current. And same thing if we have electrons. Electrons will flow down a concentration gradient. Electrons have a negative charge, so the electron diffusion current will have a positive charge there. Whenever there's a concentration gradient, there will be a diffusion current. It has nothing to do with the charge on these carriers. It's in addition to the effects that are due to electric fields and charges. So now let's go back to this uh, example that we began with. And let's say we're in equilibrium. So we have a non-uniformly doped semiconductor. We're in equilibrium, so we have some equilibrium hole density that we've produced by doping the semiconductor with a position-dependent doping density. If we look at this concentration, we see, well, holes have to flow down a concentration gradient. But then we stop and think that, well, this semiconductor is in equilibrium. We can't have any current flowing in equilibrium. So what's going on? Well, there can't be any current. We must conclude that there has to be a drift current in the equal and opposite direction to counteract this diffusion current and make sure that the total current is zero. Okay. We'll see a little bit later in the next unit when we draw energy band diagrams how we can see where this electric field comes from. We could even compute it if we want to. But at this point, you know, it would be easy for us at least to tell its sign. You know, is it pointing to the left or is it pointing to the right? And it seems clear that an electric field pointing to the left will exert a positive force on holes, push them back towards the left, and counteract this net movement of holes down the concentration gradient due to diffusion. So there'll be an electric field that points to the left that will get set up. And we'll discuss in the next unit where that electric field comes from. Okay, so 
the drift diffusion equation is really um, a fundamental equation that is widely used in semiconductor work. We've seen where it comes from now. Our fundamental current equation relates the current to the gradient of the quasi-Fermi level, but we can re-express that as a drift component and a diffusion component. We can do the same thing for electrons. When we want the total current in a semiconductor device, Frequently, one of them is important and the other one is not important, but there are cases where they're both important, then we have to add the two currents together. We've seen that a key parameter here is the mobility, and we've seen how to relate it to material properties like mean free path or scattering time and effective mass. The other parameter important in these equations is the diffusion coefficient, and we've learned that that's not really a, an independent a coefficient. It's closely related to the mobility according to this Einstein relation, d over mu is equal to kt over q. Okay, so we have accomplished what we wanted to in the first three lectures of this unit. We've discussed carrier transport in both small devices, large devices. This would work anywhere in between. The other two processes that are important out of equilibrium are recombination of carriers and generation of carriers. We'll be continue this discussion by talking about recombination in the next lecture.